So shall we get started? I just want to say welcome everyone to One School Houses, uh, what's happening this, this week. And so with me today, I have someone who's really important. I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development for One School House. And I have Liz Cates with me. And Liz, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what you do here? And then I'm going to tell everyone why you're here. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. I am the director of school and student support at One Schoolhouse. I've been on the team for three years. Um, at One Schoolhouse, uh, what I do is um, I am the link between students, teachers, and schools. And so what that means is that I'm in my student support role. I'm responsible for tracking student performance and progress and helping students who run into a tough time. I'm also in charge of working with parents. So we have a slightly different communication system in that uh, our parents, if they have questions about courses, don't go to teachers. They, in fact, go through our, my office, the Office of Academics. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that and how we're built, because, largely because we're built as a consortium. But what it means is that I have a lot of conversations with parents, especially at the start of the school, as their kids are adjusting to learning online. Um, and talking and interpreting that process for parents. Great. Well, thank you. So one of the things about One School House is that we have a summer school program that enrolls more students than some upper schools do. So it's pretty substantial. And Liz and I were talking earlier about the webinar that she has for parents as part of that. And I asked her, I said, well, do you think that our academic leaders could benefit from hearing about how you communicate with parents with students who are gonna take an online class. And obviously she said yes, because we're here. <laughs> um, but so Liz, do you wanna elaborate a little bit about that? And then I'm also going to share some slides from that. And we're gonna talk through kind of what's getting communicated and then we're gonna add in some pieces that have come up in the academic leadership courses that we've been doing. So you talk, I'll get my slides shared. Sure, so one of the first things that I say to parents is that, Online learning is different than learning in person. It's not better or it's worse, it's just different. And most of our students, um, at least up until this March, had spent 10, 11, 12 years learning how to do school one way. And that was in a classroom with other kids and with a teacher. And then when you move them online, you know, they, our students in independent schools, they know how to do school. And most of their strategies work online, but not all of them. Um, I sort of liken it to thinking about a varsity ice hockey player going to her first yoga class. You know, she's in top condition. She like she's been she's an expert. She knows what she's doing. And then all of a sudden, she's asked to make her body do something that it's never done before. And she has the strength and the conditioning, but still like. She's never figured out how to, you know, get her ankle up around her ears. Um, and it takes some time. <laughs> but because she has that strong foundation, she picks up those skills pretty quickly. And then she runs with it. And that's what online learning is like for our students. It's that first class where you're like, I, most of what I know works, but not everything. And that's a little destabilizing. So a lot of times around the second, third, fourth week, I'll get uh, emails from schools or parents saying, you know, my child says that they can't learn online. And what I've learned that actually means is that the student is saying, this is making me really uncomfortable and I don't feel like I know how to do this yet. And I say that's okay. And you have to say that's okay in that moment. Um, take a deep breath. You are going to get this. It's we don't expect you to know everything. And then we go from there. So that is some great advice. Before we begin sharing our slides, and I'm gonna to have to um, restart something. My fan has kicked in, but I'm not gonna disappear um, and leave you hanging here. But so one of the things that you talked about is that when we were talking together is that School leaders have some experience in sharing big news, and when they move into this hybrid learning mode, they've got some skills to draw on. 
So can you talk a little bit about, you know, times that you've had to share that there's a big change, whether it's good or bad, and how school leaders can draw on that experience to explain their hybrid model? Sure. So the best uh, connection I can make is that every year we have schools who come to us in the summer and say, we'd like to move a class online. Um, so these are students who have signed up for a class believing it's going to be on campus um, and with a teacher that they know. Um, and all of a sudden, the school has to say to students and parents, we're actually doing this in a very different way. We've learned a few things that make a tremendous difference in that communication process. The first is being transparent and open and giving folks a chance to ask questions. Um, the second piece is making sure people have lots of resources so that they understand how our online learning class is aligned with the values of, a school, of, this, of their school and that we come from the same places and we want the same things for this, our students. Um, and then third is that we need to explain to them that we know how this works. We know how students learn online we understand, the, we understand through the research, we understand through our experience, and so we're really confident about the, about the kind of learning experience they'll have with us. And those are the three things that you're gonna need to do with your parents when you roll out your, your hybrid learning plans and you do your scenario planning. You're going to want to be transparent and let people know what you're doing. You're gonna to wanna to give them the chance to ask questions, but it's also really important that you're going to let them know that you're the experts and that what you're doing in your hybrid learning program isn't a 180 turn from what you do on campus. It's consistent, it has the same hallmarks, and it has the same standards. Yeah, and we've talked about that a little bit, that sliding into campus feels to students like, oh, this is my place and I belong here. And I think doing the same thing for students in that online space when you have to move to your hybrid model, that you are sliding into your campus and it's where you belong. Yep. And so what are some ways that teachers can create that sense of belonging for students? So the first is connection. And what the research shows us about online spaces is that the student's connection to the teacher is just as instrumental in their success as it is on campus. And so all those things that teachers know about how to build relationships, they're gonna use those again here. They're going to use those by talking to kids, not just about what's going on in class, but about um, talking to them about what their interests are, about asking students to share with each other and with their classmates about what's going on. So we have one teacher at one schoolhouse who every week posts uh, what he calls a before the bell question. And sometimes it's like, what's your favorite sport to watch? Um, or it's, um, it's, what's your favorite TV show? It's just a place for kids to get to know each other. Um, and sometimes he participates. So it's a place for students to get to know your, the teacher too. And that's really important. The other thing is just being visually present in the online space. So um, the story that I like to tell is that, um, at one schoolhouse, just like in any other class, um, you know, the teacher who creates a course, teaches it for a few years, then sometimes passes it on. And that's what happened um, in our Latin program this year, that we had a longstanding teacher who had built our second year Latin course and then passed it on to a new teacher. And just as we do in schools, um, you know, teacher uses some of the resources that the previous teachers developed and builds some of her own. Um, unfortunately, our second year Latin teacher, our new teacher passed away very suddenly in January of this year. And what that meant was that our experienced teacher said, you know, I will stop, I will step in. I built this course, I can step in. And so she started out um, by meeting with each of the students individually. Um, and what almost all of them said to her was, oh, I know you already. And it was because they had seen her in those videos and they had heard her voice the visual presence of the teacher in videos and in audio is a tremendously important piece of building connection so that your students really do know who your teachers are. Yeah. So, and I think that's something that's a long-standing truth in education is that emotional resonance 
opens learning pathways. It helps build neural pathways. All right, so I'm gonna admit, I have been doing some serious tap dancing here behind the screens and I've got the slides up. Um, so I will just be uh, a little bit revealing here. So One Schoolhouse is an all Apple shop and Sarah comes from a Windows environment and I'm learning. And today I did some fast learning on a recording in front of all of you. So um, thank you for bearing with me. So we're gonna see some slides that are sort of what we already talked about, but we'll move forward from there. Um, so this is what we're doing today. And as I mentioned, Liz did the exact same thing earlier for, oops, I'm gonna slide down here, for parents this week in two separate segments. So I want you to know that we're modeling what we experience here too. And so this is why I said to Liz, hey Liz. So one of the things that we wanna say over and over again to our families, of course, is that student and staff safety comes first when we're making decisions about a hybrid model. And when Liz opened her talk yesterday, program and philosophy comes first. How are we one schoolhouse wherever we are? And in your school, that's gonna be even more important. What are you doing to make sure that you are still yourself, your distinct school? So I'm flying through this part. And so Liz, do you wanna talk a little bit um, more about this. We address that hybrid learning is different than distance learning. I think this is a distinction though that schools are really going to want to make with their families that what's happening in the fall is going to be different from what happened in the spring. Sure and one of the thing one of the terms that I've heard people starting to use recently which I really appreciate is uh, crisis distance learning or emergency distance learning um, because we want to acknowledge that that wasn't the plan and that you do things differently when you're building the plan as opposed to when you've had time to build the plan. So we talk about, when we talk about distance learning, it was an abrupt transition and students took the tools and the strategies that they used in the classroom and pulled them online. So that they were using the same materials that they built um, and that they were using the same cadence that they had been building in the class for six, for six months. That's different from hybrid learning, which is built to be able to go back and forth. And when it's online, it takes full advantage of the flexibility and the resources of the internet. So what that means is that instead of where we were in the spring is that we sort of cobbled together two different things. We were pulling together doing in-person learning in a distance framework. And now in the fall, what we're doing is we're really ready for this. And our teachers have learned what the elements are that will build a learning experience for a student. Um, in the classroom, design and delivery are the same thing. Right. Um, and online, they're not. And design is really important for student experience. If you, we were in the tech world, we call that the user experience or the UX. Um, and that's part of why, um, for example, shopping online at Amazon is pleasant and maybe shopping online at another place isn't. It's because Amazon has really thought about the user experience. And so what hybrid learning really focuses on is making sure that the design of the online experience is complementary and consistent with what happens on campus. That's a great point. And I think one of the other points that you um, shared is that there was, a critical conversation that schools have to happen have that's a little bit different this year with a hybrid model around equity. Mm -hmm. And so you and I talked about how it's both institutional and it's personal. So do you want to talk a little bit about institutional conversations around equity? Yeah. So um, the DEIB educator, Allison Park, um, who works at Blink Consulting, I heard her speak a few years ago. One of the things she said that really resonated to me is that our standing state is inequity, which is that in our communities, we replicate the inequities that are in the larger world. And if we don't want to do that, that it has to be active and systemic. Otherwise, we're going to return to that resting state. So your commitment to equity needs to not just be on the level of individual students, it really needs to be on the level of the program as a whole. 
So the first piece where we see equity is access. It's access to technology and access to high speed internet and making sure that everybody in your community has that access. We have time to figure that out in the summer that we didn't have in March and April. Uh, the second piece is making sure that your teachers are communicating expectations for your students that are culturally sensitive and relevant. So what I mean by that is a biology teacher who tells students to go out into their backyard is neglecting the fact that not all of your students will have a backyard. Um, not all of them will have access to be able to safely walk to someplace in nature. So you're going to want to, as a school, talk about the assumptions that you can't make. Um, and as a school, you're going to help teachers see their blind spots because that's the thing about blind spots, we can't see them for ourselves. Right. And so at, saying to a teacher, you know, hey, figure out these things isn't going to help because the teacher doesn't even know that he or she doesn't know them. And that's a place where you as an academic leader can really be a leader in ethical implementation of equity. And that's a place where as teachers are building the online components of their hybrid course, that leaders can be really helpful because it, when it's built out before it happens, rather than this spring when we were flying the airplane while we were building it, um, there's a chance to catch things like that and to be involved. And then there's another aspect of equity this year that's a little bit more personal, which is that as teachers are that front line, as Liz said, for students, they're in the best spot to catch changes that may happen with students, some of whom we may not expect. Um, Liz described the athlete who takes her first yoga class. There's also the student who has always been well supported in ways that were visible to the school, whose life can take a, a real turn um, for a variety of reasons. And I don't wanna start listing all the things that have happened to students this year because we've all lived that. But teachers are so important in saying what the, looking for what this child needs now and really being on alert with the rest of the institution so that you can keep an eye on, on your community and know how people need you. So I do wanna share that on our website, we have a for parents video that may be helpful. And Liz, one of the things that I was gonna ask you is what are the best ways for schools to communicate with parents? I know we like to talk about multiple modalities. Sure, so, so I can, let me start out by just listing all the different <laughs> things that you can do. You can email, you can text, you can have a web page. You can, um, if you're using an LMS system, you can send out system-wide messages. Um, when kids are on campus, you can send home paper. Um, I could keep going. You can hand out flyers in the carpool line or send stuff home with kids. So there are lots and lots of different ways to communicate with people and not everybody, and, and everybody only hears some of them. And, and everybody only hears some of the stuff that they're actually listening to. Right. So we know that we have to say the same thing multiple ways. Um, we work hard to, um, when we communicate with parents, to make sure that it's something that they can refer back to. So an email or when we have a live webinar, we record it and we post it and we send the link out. So that we're making sure that, that we're responsive to the fact that not everybody can stop at noontime and watch a webinar for 45 minutes. We know that, and that's why we record them. Um, I think also that when you're thinking not just about the platforms that you're communicating in, you also have to think about the ways that you can help parents understand what you're doing. Was that the, the second sort of part of this question, Sarah? It is, and I think that that's something that, the reason I put this for parents is have parents know where they can go and get that information because as Liz said, they don't know that they want it until they want it. And if it was an email that you sent out three weeks ago, um, it, it may be lost in the ether. And so having that one place, like so many schools have done around COVID in general. And this is an example of how one schoolhouse shares 
here's what it means, the experience that your students happening, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to translate that into a hybrid environment. So very clear, what does it mean to be asynchronous and what does it mean to be paced so that parents could look at this and say, oh, this is what you're asking my child to do. And so Liz, do you get um, good feedback on information that comes out this way? I do. I also regularly get the question, what time is geometry? Um, so what I would say is that when we put this up, when we set it up like this, people absolutely get it. But one of the things that we also realize is that um, if it's just in the body of an email, that it's very easy to skim over something and not realize you don't know it and you didn't pay attention. So I find that when we're doing presentations, it's really important not to overload on the text because people do the same thing. Right. So one of the things that we learned this spring is that when school looks like what parents remember school, teacher talking, student listening, parents identify that as my child is still in school. We also know that Zoom fatigue hit us hard, whether it was Zoom or not, but Zoom fatigue seems to be the term, and that there was exhaustion and it's unsustainable. And then we also know something about, you know, kids and learning when they're in a, looking at a screen for hours on end of somebody else talking. So how do we, how do we communicate with parents that some of what's happening is really important and we're making a transition in this hybrid model? Sure. So, you know, in a lot of ways, school is kind of like a black box to most of our parents. You drop them off, they, stuff happens, and then you pick them back up and they're smarter. Um, awesome. <laughs> I wish it worked that way for my kids. Um, I, I love their school. Um, so, but what that means is that parents assume that, that uh, saying that my child is taught is the same as my child is learning. And part of what we have to do, what hybrid learning does, is it actually makes it clear that teaching and learning are much more complicated processes than that. Yeah. Parents, when you say school to parents, parents think of a teacher talking and kids receiving. And that because it comes out of this, the teacher's mouth, that then the kids have learned it. And we all know as educators that that's not how it works. We present information. There is direct instruction. There's also practice. There's also feedback. And that students' learning happens in multiple modalities and in multiple valences and over time. So I think a lot of the frustration that we got this, that a lot of schools received this spring was if my kid isn't in front of a teacher on Zoom, they're not learning. And it's very important that we start talking to parents actually about what the process of learning is. That yes, direct instruction plays a key role. You can't get rid of it. But also that learning happens when students are independent and that their practice is learning and inquiry is learning and mistakes are learning. All of that process is there. I love that. I think one way to summarize it is that if a student is in deeply immersed in an experience and they're growing and that experience was designed by an expert teacher mm -hmm. and they are getting guidance and feedback and at the end of that experience they're more knowledgeable. I don't want to say smarter because it's a loaded word. But the, so that's teaching, right? Student experience designed by an expert teacher from which a student grows guided by that teacher. And helping our schools understand that is going to be really critical. Yeah, I think, I think also what I'd say is that right now our paradigm is school is where kids go to be taught. And that for our students, it's a passive experience. And I think the paradigm needs to shift for parents. Again, we know this as educators, but we need our parents to understand that school is where kids go to learn, that it is active. And that that active experience of being a student, that can happen in lots of different ways and lots of different places. It's a great, that's a great ending of sort of the slides. And then we wanted to leave some time for questions. 
So if you'd like to, you can put questions in the chat or if somebody wants to come on and ask Liz a question about communication with parents, we're up for that. So please share any questions that you have. And you can use either the Q&A or the chat for that. Okay, so Liz, here's a question. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna reframe it just a little bit. So it seems like some parents are expecting schools to provide Zoom for, for the traditional hours that school used to be. And um, what would your initial response be to a parent who said, this is what I, what I need from my, the school. I need Zoom from eight to four. So I'm not gonna answer that question the way you asked it, but I am gonna answer it. Okay. So let me start out by saying I'm the parent of two uh, fourth grade boys. So when I'm talking about this, I am talking about it from an extremely practical level as somebody who watched distance learning play out in their own house and there were days of tremendous success and there were days where we all ended and saying like, I really don't even wanna look at you across the dinner table. Um, love my kids, so frustrated. I think the thing I learned is that it's way easier to teach other people's children than your own all the time. So when I say that, when I'm telling that story because I understand why this parent says this. <laughs> I understand because school does also serve the function of childcare for parents and it makes their work possible. And that's part of why schools will reopen in some shape or form as much as they can next year. There are larger imperatives to what schools do. But saying to a parent, our, our compact with our, with our parents is to, is to guide kids learning. And so saying to parents, we will give you a framework for how you can organize that time. And we will give your, your kids meaningful work and play to do during that time. Because if you're talking about anybody from seventh grade down, there should be play involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, kids need that to grow. That's why we still have research, recess, even when they're in high school. Um, and we, but... And we will have our teachers accessible during that time. But to have a student in constant direction from, for, for eight hours a day is not how they will learn. And if we were to do that, we would not be delivering on what we promise you when, when you send your child to us. And we just have to acknowledge that parents, especially of your younger students, parents are just going to be partners in different ways. And that means they need to know a little bit more about what we do. That's great. I love that addressing the why we're doing what we're doing and, and what the outcomes are. And that actually leads really nicely into the next question, which is how to address the concerns of parents about the outcomes of the distance learning and about assessment of the learning experience. So this is another one of those places where I think we need to break down parents' assumptions about what assessment does um, and, and that what assessment can be. Everybody is familiar with assessment looking like a test, that a teacher watches you and you write it down on a piece of paper and you're working alone. So the first thing we need to do is to be able to talk to parents explicitly about what the outcomes are what the standards are and how we assess for those standards. Because parents may not realize that asking students to do a scale drawing is a form of assessment. They may not realize that having kids create a video about how to multiply fractions is a form of assessment. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell them at the beginning of the year, this is what we expect your students to learn. Not we study the gold rush, but we expect your students to be able to articulate the different ethnic groups who were involved in the gold rush and what their motivations were for being there. And then as you roll assignments out, you're going to want to connect those to those objectives. And when you're assessing, you know, you're going to want your teachers to communicate with parents in different ways, and you're going to want to say, here's how we assess them on their skills. Online learning is by its very nature more transparent, 
that mm -hmm. means our teachers are going to need to be a little more transparent in their communications too. Otherwise, parents won't understand what they're doing. And then teachers have a much harder job of trying to help somebody come down from frustration that wouldn't have been there if they had a bigger picture of what was going on. So I think what you're um, really saying as well is something you and I have talked about, which is that school is transparent in a way mm -hmm. that it hasn't been before. And so there's a lot that parents are seeing and maybe wondering about. And if we can clear up or we like to say demystify some of the things that we're doing with students and showing that this is actually giving a teacher good insight into where a child's progression is on a sequence of skill development and where they need to go next. And so that's, that's something that I think our parents will really appreciate. So it's time for us to end. We've got a question um, that I am happy to read because we are going to address this next week. Next week, we're going to be pulling in some communications experts from outside of the school world on how schools can balance the flow of information when sometimes the answer is still, we're not exactly sure yet. And I think as, as good school people, we all wanna like cross the T's and dot the I's and here's what's happening. And I never thought I would ask anybody this question in the second half of June when I say, what is your anticipated beginning of classes date? But that's still in flux in some places. So we're looking forward to that. Liz, Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks. It's really fun to have this conversation. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next week. And thank you for your um, grace with my learning my new computer. So I appreciate that.